everybody, it's Michelle from Michelle Bakes again and this time I'm doing the vlog where I am answering your questions. Um, some of them I'm answering some questions, I'm telling you about some of the things that people have said to me and I'm also going to ask you some questions. So um, let's get going then. The first ones are with relation to the scissors i'm sorry i've got this here i've got it fairly big and i'm videoing this from my laptop so that to see if it'll make a bit you know it might help um so there the first one is from sarah baskerville and it relates to the video about scissors and rotary blades and sharpening them and sarah is relating this to the scissors sharpening and she is basically saying, um, I wonder if your subscribers would be interested to know that my company has been sharpening scissors for decades, any kind of scissors too. They are at Pump House Farm Supplies near Congleton. We provide a fully reconditioning service by post. Hairdressers use our service and their scissors can cost hundreds of pounds. We can also service sewing scissors. You can sharpen at home, but you will need skill and experience. And I think that's true. That's very true, Sarah. Uh, there are a few of you who have the con who have had the confidence to follow my vlog and have got back to me and said how marvelous it's sharpened your scissors. Other ones would probably be thinking, oh, "There's no way I can do that to my good expensive scissors." So, Sarah, I'll put the the link down below of Sarah's website, and you can always send them there. She said, we can be found online. We don't normally advertise. It's just that I've taken up sewing lately as a hobby. So she, uh, she's probably come across my vlog and uh, thought she'd pass that information on. So as I've said, a link is down below for where, to, where you can get them uh, serviced. Um, Heather Thompson. Heather's concerned when I was showing you the vlog about the rotary blades. Uh, I did say be careful because the blades are sharp and I did use a cloth to hold it because um, it can it, you can cut yourself. And Heather Thompson says they sell cut resistant gloves which I would recommend wearing if you're going to do this. Now I have heard of them. I don't know. I'll have to have a look and see if I can source them. And if I, ha if I can, I'll put the link down below for you if you wanted to buy some. Uh, but yes, you can. It is a risky job. And uh, Rene Slav, hi Rene, you've, you've uh, you messaged me a few times. Rene Slav, she's in America, I believe, says she uses a rotary blade sharpener but also gives a note of caution. She had to have stitches in her hand because she cut herself with them. So I think obviously if she uses a rotary blade, she's just getting the blades out. And we all experience that. Changing the blade in your rotary, rotary uh, cutter is not, a, especially when you put a new one in very sensitive task to do and if you get it wrong you've got to keep taking it out and you're prone to cutting yourself and i'm very good at cutting myself uh, the kind of jobs i do at work i'm constantly cutting myself um dawn it dawn 69r she mentioned something that i do know of and i forgot to mention and that was if you take aluminium foil and fold it up uh fold it into till it's about something like that kind of size Get your scissors, and these are just cheap ones that I've got off on the desk. Keep cutting into the into the aluminium like that. You will actually sharpen the blades by cutting into the scissors. Uh, thank you, Dawn. That's a good that's a good point. Then we go on to uh, <laughs> we go on to my the bag one where I talked about the um, the sweet pea saddle bag. And two people, Michelle Sloan or Michelle Sloan, I think it sounds nice, Michelle, it sounds very like my name, and Seaside Mom both pointed out that I actually had the flowers upside down. And that is a wrap on my knuckles because I should know that. I used to teach biology to, to, to 13 to 16 year olds. Mind you, I must say it was in the 70s, so it's a long time ago. And I should have recognised that the flowers were upside down. I also should have recognised, as, as Seaside Mum pointed out, they are echinacea flowers, because I did wonder what they were, and I didn't bother to check on them. And I'm not only a biology teacher, an ex-biology teacher, but I love gardening, so I should know that. And But the thing was, I kept looking at the fabric and thinking, 
well, should it go that way? Or should it go that way? Or should it go that way? Or should it go that way? But I liked it. I, I think I must have done it the way that I thought it looked nice. I thought it looked nice with the, with the petals going downwards. But I think it should have been the other way. I can't remember. One way or two, I had it the upside down way. Um, so, Seaside Mom, yes, you um, you and um, Michelle, thank you very much. You pointed that out well. And uh, although some people said it really didn't matter, but uh, I still um, I still felt a bit guilty for what I'd done. Sarah J asked where I got my coke from. Now, I got my coke from Tanya Fabrics, and Tanya Fabrics is on Facebook. It's for, She's a UK-based, so it might not be helpful if you're USA-based, but basically, if you put Tanya Fabrics in the search bar, you'll come to her page. You have to ask to join, but... Uh, and once you get one, uh, she'll tell you within, she'll uh, you know enrol you within 24 hours, likely. But once you get on, it's like a, um, it's like going into a treasure trove. She has lots, she keeps putting up lots of fabrics, lot, the bag fabrics, the nice fabrics. She puts up cork, she put, puts up cork, she puts up um, hardware uh, buckles and all sorts of hardware stuff. <coughs> she puts her buckles and hardware stuff and uh, you know hardware handbag hardware so there's lots to choose from and i had to say i've had to ban myself from going on her page since last november because i was spending an awful lot of money on on handbag fabrics on handbag coke and all sorts and i kept thinking oh you're never going to do this i've got a box full of hardware which is unbelievable but she does sell nice things and you have to sometimes draw the line and say, right, enough's enough. Because what you do is you tend to order it. She shows you what there is and you say, I can have a, oh, give me half a metre of that, a fat quarter of that, give me a metre of that. And then she'll suddenly send you the invoice when it all comes in because she, she buys to order. And when it all comes in, she, you suddenly furnish with a bill for £40, £50. Pounds, and you go, oh, I forgot about that. So um, just go easy. But I have to say the cork that she does, from what everybody tells me, is the best cork. I think it's Portuguese cork, which is Portuguese born. And um, it is lovely cork. It really is nice. Um, then Sue Knuckles said, try Flex Foam Stabiliser in your wallet. Yes, I think you're right, Sue. It is Flex Foam Stabiliser is good. But I've also found something way up there. If you can see, I've got a shelf up here. Can you see that roll up there? Well, that is a roll of foam. It's actually under wooden floor. It's under flooring foam. Uh, it's actually like a foam that you put under your wooden floor when you're laying a wooden floor. And I, can't I bought it for some reason for work. And it wasn't for the floor. It was to use for some other purpose. And I only needed about a half a metre of it, and I've actually got quite a few yards there. And it's really good. It's um, It's got, I'll show you. I've cut some off to show you. It's shiny on that side, shiny on the other side, and it's a foam in the middle. Sorry, I'm looking here. It's shiny on that side, shiny on that side, and it's got a, it's like a foam in between. And... What I found is when I, if I put the fabric on top and then I press it, that actually it actually causes the fabric to stick to it a bit. And also what you could do is spray that with glue and then put your fabric on and iron it and it'll stick to that. But it's quite nice. It's not very thick. It's not very thick, but it's lovely, flexible foam. And I've used that to line a couple of bags and uh, a couple of purses. And I found that that really works well. So I've got... I have got that much to use up, so I'm going to have to use that up first. Um, I just think it's quite practical, that. Um, so, yes, Flex Foam Stabiliser, yes, but this one, I think there's about five or six metres, and it cost me about £20. So, I got it from a DIY shop. The, you know, for flooring DIY, and I passed it, and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I can't, as I say, I can't remember what I used it for. I think I put double-sided tape on there and stuck it onto something, onto my, some coasters or something at first. But, uh, yeah, very handy, that. 
Uh, then <laughs> Practical Stitches said, I shouldn't be so hard on myself for the bags that I make. And that, I'm afraid, is a failing from my father because my father always taught me, my father always taught me, um, he had a saying in French, je mieux que ça. So whatever he saw, he always felt you could, either he could do better than that or, you know, um, whenever somebody showed him something or he saw something, he always found, was thinking in his head a better way to do it. And I'm a bit like that. I'm never happy with whatever I make. I always want to be able to do better. And I haven't achieved that perfection. My mother used to say I always put myself down, but I haven't, in my eyes, I haven't achieved that perfection yet. Probably never will, but, you know, got to aim high. <laughs> Louise Green. Now, Louise asked a question. Let me just get down to it. I'm going to try and answer it as far as I know, but I'm sure that a lot of you out there will know the answer better than I do because I don't know much about London. She says, she's obviously not from England. I think she's from America. And she says... We will be in London in August and I'd like to shop fabric. My favourite is wool and or silk. We won't be there long, so I'll have about half a day to ditch the male population and lose myself in fabric bliss. I don't want to waste time looking for a... Going down to the next page. Looking for a great shop or shops. Any suggestions would be appreciate, greatly appreciated. I go between the north of England down to through London to visit my daughter who lives 20 miles north of Portsmouth and every time I do that I promise myself and I book my tickets so that on my return journey I have two hours spare and it's always with the intention of going to Gold Hawk Road where I've heard there are lots of fabric shops um, I've always never got there because I've kind of been on my way back after having been away for so long and I'm thinking, oh, all I want to do is just go back to the train, to the station, get my train home. So I never do go there. And I, I would like to go and visit Gold Hawk Road. I think from what everybody says, it sells good fabrics. Claire McKennis, I think it is, from Beautiful Things, she took, um, I met up with an American lady called Laurie Ann Payne, who then went and met Claire, and Claire took her to Gold Hawk Road to see fabrics, and I think she was pleasantly impressed. I'm not sure. Um, I do know there's Liberties, but Liberties is a very expensive shop, and uh, the Sovereign shop. But I think you people who watch, who live in London or live in that area, or who go to London shopping, might be able to help Louise more than I can. What is the best shop? For Louise to go to or what is the best area for Louise to go to to find fabrics when she's only got half a day and um, she's looking for wool and silk so that's the question I'm throwing to you um, the next question is for is about the dressing gown I made do you remember the dressing gown where I cut the bit off and sewed down the front and this is from Bridget Logue hi Bridget you are Brigitte I don't know if it's Bridget or Brigitte um, you mentioned that you would have put a long zipper in and that you've got several dressing gowns with zippers in the front i think that's a great idea i didn't put a zipper in because it never occurred to me i just wanted something quick and easy and when i read that to my husband he said well he says i suppose he says it's exercise for you to put your arms up in the air he says from the time that you can't put your arms up in the air maybe the zip might be better but as i said to him then i've, I've still got to bend down to get to the bottom to pull the zip up so um so yes i do think the zip idea is much better um lenny jensen or lena jensen uh asks if i've got a have i got a favorite blouse pattern uh she has a large bust like me and do i have a favorite blouse pattern i tend to like blouse patterns or if you could call this a blouse i tend to like blouse patterns that cover everything this one here i've shown you it before it's a straight up and down. I've got a big bust. I've got a big belly. I go in at the waist. I've got uh, a big bottom, sadly. Um, and so I, if I wear something tight, if I wear something really pinched in and tight like that, it look, it, it's, it helps me. It, it accentuates my bust. 
but it also accentuates my belly and my and my bottom. So I tend to like something that hangs over it all, rather like a, a tabard or a, a, you know something that's loose like this. Um, and I, I just think it's more for me. It's more flattering. I have seen some other clothes that that have little waists and things, and I am going to make a couple of blouses in. The, I have got a make nine plan, which unfortunately I still haven't got around to doing yet, but I've got a make nine. And on that make nine, I think I've got two blouses that I'm doing. One's a shirty type blouse and the other is the Briere shirt. I've done the Briere shirt twice. I'll tell you all about it next time, but this is the one I'm going to make it again as a part of my make nine. I like the look of it. I like it when I've made it. So I'll be able to tell you more about that later. But... This is yet another question I'm going to throw to you, to you ladies out there. If you've got big busts or you've got big bodies, tell me what is your favourite blouse. And if you want to send me a photograph, I'll happily take it out. If you, and you want me to put it up to show people, um, my in email address is down there in the information box. I'll happily talk about that blouse and put a picture up to show people what it looks like on a bigger person if you don't want me to show your face i will cut your head off or you know you can cut your own head off if you want you know just email the picture to me and uh, because it does help when you see people you know when you see when you see a pattern for example that the pattern i just made um in my previous video oh do you know i can't remember which one it is i'll put a picture of it that one looked lovely on the thin lady, but when I put made it for myself, it wasn't doing any doing anything for me. So um, I would like to know how, what kind of pattern do you think flatters your figure, and maybe we you know we might find something that we all want to do. So yes, do email me, do let me have your pictures, or if not, just tell me which ones you like. Um, then we were talking about the waterproofing spray. And Jenny Flake, hi Jenny, I'm always liaising with you over Instagram. She's got some, she makes some lovely things, does Jenny. Um, she says, I buy all these waterproofing spray at less than £2 an aerosol when they have it in. It certainly works on raincoats and as I've done a couple, not sure about stain guarding, but must be similar. I haven't been to all this for a long time, Jenny Flake, and my son swears by it, my daughter swears by it, a lot of friends swear by it. My father used to swear by Lidl or Lidl. He used to call Lidl. If there are some good things in Lidl. You have to go and see there are good things. So um, he used to swear by Lidl. And so, yes, I should, I really, if you can find it there, go for it. It's very reasonable. All these well known for being cheap. Um, Janice K. Again, we're referring to the, the stain guard. I've used that stain and moisture barrier for years on coats shoes boots and a couch and a love seat and the kids camping tent so it must be good she she found it she's obviously found it works um then the next one was with reference to my nappy bag do you remember i made a nappy bag <coughs> for my daughter-in-law's sister who has since had a little boy she loved the bag and nadine wood says and my only question is if perhaps it would have been better to make the strap on your altered bag adjustable so it could be used as a shoulder strap i guess it's just personal preference but i but i would have preferred a shoulder strap thereby freeing up my hands for my little one very true nadine i did agree with you and it wasn't until i actually passed it on to my daughter-in-law to give us the present that i thought oh we should have done a shoulder strap because yes i agree with you you've got baby in your arm Yes, I was thinking you could dangle it there, but baby in your arm, you probably could do with it on your shoulder and then you can you can walk around and do whatever you want. So totally agree with you there. A shoulder strap would have been better. Bad planning on my part. Michelle Sloan again, Michelle, or Michelle, Michelle, Michelle um, she has said, what is a dummy? Now, I did answer it on my, when she asked me this, but I just had to, I thought it was a good one just to, to answer. A dummy is a pacifier for those of you in America, as is a nappy bag is a diaper bag. And um, there are many other words that the Americans say one thing and we say the other. You say tomato, we say tomato. You say potato, 
We say potato, you say potato. Do you really? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying the words of the song. Anyway, um, then Kathleen Carter suggested gussets in the sides for expansion on that bag, on this bag here. I think she meant this bag, where I was saying that it, it was a bit close and you couldn't get much in. So if I'd put gussets on there, if I'd adapted it with gussets, that might have worked even better. Um, then Anne Blatchley loved the bag that I made, the Tokyo bag by Charlene Bag, and she suggested that it could be used, take away the wet wipes section. You could put tissues or something in there, but she said you could convert it into a, a laptop workstation by putting, instead of where the see-through fabric was, you put a, a card and build it up, uh, strengthen it, and then you've got places to put your pencils in and your pens and your books and your laptop. Great idea, Anne. I, I think I would agree with you. It's very worth, you know, the consideration. <clears throat> then we go back. I'm going back on these questions. Then we have Penguin and Pear, Claire from Penguin and Pear, who was relating to when I did the, the, the trip to France that we've made. And she said, out of interest, with a French father, were you bilingual from birth? I wasn't, Claire. My, um, I think in those days, I don't know, because the mother raises the child, I didn't speak much French. And the only communication French was between my mum and my dad. My mum used to sometimes talk to my dad in French. She, was, she wasn't, you know, she had to learn it when she met him. She knew a little bit. But she used to communicate with him in French when she wanted to say something to him that she didn't want us to hear. But as the years progressed, by the time we were seven, eight and nine, we'd heard so much French, we knew exactly what she was saying. And so we used to say, we know what you're going to get us for Christmas. <laughs> so, so um, no, I didn't. My sister, um, who, has, who, who lives in France, she's 75 and she has lived in France since she was 26. She raised her daughter both English, teach, speaking English and French. And because she was a mother, the, my niece was able to speak both languages. Um, so, yes, that was, I think it's maybe because the my mother was more of an influence than my father in those days. Kathy Williams says, if you drive you, your UK car to France with the steering wheel on the right side, is it awkward to drive in France when one drives on the right side of the road? Um, the very first few times that you do do it, you've got to keep saying, keep to the right, 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 keep to the right. And also you've got to have a very good passenger sat there because that passenger's on the middle of the road there. You've got to have a very good passenger who knows the road, who can look and say, right, it's okay to overtake, right, you pull out, you're all right, you know. So that's... Um, the first couple of times it is quite, you know, I wouldn't say hard. It's just getting your head around the fact that you're driving on the other side of the road. And it, what's even harder is when you get back to England, telling yourself to get back to the normal side of the road. But um, the good thing about driving to France is uh, if you drive across the channel or if you get the ferry across or you drive across, through the tunnel, when you get to the other side, it's a case of just following everybody and everybody goes and stays on the right hand side. You do what they do and gradually you get onto the to the main roads, onto the motorways and you follow them. Uh, also, you're very fortunate because there is much, much less traffic in France than there is in England. A motorway in England is jam packed with cars. A motorway in France, if you do use the motorways, I mean, we've used them a couple of times just for speed. You're better off going through the countryside and, and enjoying the views. But when I have used the motorway, I've had to say to my husband, look, look at this. And he'd say, what? Look at what? Look at what? What, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? Look at this. And he'd say, what am I looking at? What am I looking at? And I'm going, where's the traffic? And he's going, oh, you're right. We're on a motorway and there's only about four cars. Whereas if you're on a motorway in England, you'd be lucky if you can find a bit of space with about 20 yards around you. So, yes, um, it's much easier to drive in France. Uh, just you just got to be more aware. It's a bit like uh, it's just like going into a new town where you don't really know the road setup. You've just got to make sure your eyes and ears are watching everything. And the hardest thing is convincing yourself to keep to the right, keep to the right, keep to the right. But once you've done it a few times, you just get used to it. 
Um, Jennifer Farsh, and I think this is the last one. Let me just see. Oh, no, it's nearly the last one. Jennifer Farsh says, your name is unique, and I'd love to know the story behind your name. Well, Jennifer, there isn't any real story behind my name. I'm one of four children. My mother's name was Eileen. My father's name was Jacques. So the firstborn was called Jacqueline, 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 Jacqueline. My brother was born, and I don't know where his name came from, but he was he was the French version of George. In English, it's George. In France, it's Josh. Then my sister was born, and sadly, she's the one that always felt she's the, you know, when they say baby number three or baby number two, the middle child doesn't never is always has an issue. Well, she was the middle child. As she was the third, the second daughter. And of three, and so she, you know, she felt that she was always out of place, and she got the name Joan. And she said, and then I got Micheline. Um, I wasn't named after anyone in particular. I'm not, and I when I asked them why they chose Micheline, they just said they liked the name. Um, Joan, my father named after Joan of Arc, Jean d'Arc, but it because my mother said, Well, if we've got Jacqueline, we've got Georges, Jacqueline and Georges will call her Joan. And I, she hated that name. She said, why have I always got an English name like Joan and they've got Jacqueline, Georges and Micheline? So bless her. She, she, came, she I think when she went, she went, when she left school, she changed to Naomi. And we thought, what? <laughs> and then from Naomi, it was, it was Joanny, Johanny, and then it was Joni. And, um, you know, she, she was always changing her name because she just didn't like the name. My name, Micheline, I'm in with the right folk because Sean Connery, 007's wife, is called Micheline as well. But sadly, Jennifer, there's no backstory for me. <laughs> and lastly, the last one is from Wari Warialda Sue. Sue. And I was telling, oh, she was watching one of my vlogs. And on, on this vlog, I did a very bad thing. I ironed on top of my small cutting mat. And she said, I would never iron on my cutting mat and I'd never stand it up against the wall. And so I would agree with you. I shouldn't, as I did it, I was, as I videoed the vlog, I was telling myself I shouldn't be doing this because I don't know whether, whether it'll affect it. As it happened, it didn't affect it. But I did have an incident a little bit later where it did. I normally iron on this. And I, in one of my um, vlogs, I told you about it. It's still pinned at the end. It's basically a piece of cardboard. I don't know if you can see a piece of cardboard there that I've got folded with some wadding around it, wrapped around it. That should really be pinned. And I made like a pillowcase type of uh, thing, fabric, sewn on three sides. I should really sew that, but that's been like that for over a year. I happen to have this at the side on my table at the side. Then I had my iron and then I had my cutting board and the, I, there wasn't much space between the three and I'd gone out the room and my cat had jumped onto the table and had knocked the iron over onto the cutting board and I was away out the room for about five ten minutes when I came back in I went <gasps> quickly picked the iron up and on the cutting board it hadn't affected it it hadn't made a, any iron mark but what it had done the heat had opened all the cuts up so, and I'll show you a little picture up here. It had actually caused all those cuts that you can't normally see. Caused, where there was a cut there, it caused them to lift a little bit. So, um, doesn't pay you to have your iron um, nearby, near to your um, cutting board. And so that's the end of this uh, question and answer. I have several other vlogs to get going on. I'm trying to get through them all. Uh, the next one will probably be a make nine. I've been making a couple of clothes, two or three items of clothing, and I'll tell you about those. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen and dogs and cats, I shall catch you next time. Bye. <laughs>